not allowed to attend this event. However, anyone who disagree with us, they will given the uh, reasonable opportunity to express their opinion, ask questions, and then engage with us in a civil dialogue. However, intimidation, that if you return back to Bahrain, there will be consequences. Those statements cannot be tolerated, especially in a respect, respectful place uh, like the Human Rights Council. <clears throat> also, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking all the different uh, NGO who co-sponsored this event. I'm not going to go into the names, but I don't want to forget anything, anyone. Abbas, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a couple of names that probably might mean nothing to you. Uh, Abbas Abd Shahid Al Tannak, Hussein Abd Shahid Al Tannak, Muhammad Jasim Dismal, Habib <coughs> Jasim Dismal, Sayyid Jasim Al Wudai, Ahmed Kabul Jasim, Alawi Makki Hassan. Those are young Bahraini men graduated from high school some time ago. Like any young men had dreams to join the army or the military in their country. For some reason, all of them were denied that opportunity. Not because they were physically unfit, or their grades were low, or they engaged in some criminal behavior in their country. The reason for that is simple war. They belong to a sect called Shia, or named Shia, or Jafar. We've done a report in conjunction with the Bahrain Center for Human Rights in Bahrain, and the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy, that basically document uh, the abuses and the systematic discrimination that the majority of the Bahraini, Baharna, yes, Baharna, go through in the country. Uh, this is the report, you can take uh, a copy of it as you uh, uh, leave the office or you I mean, the place. One of the more popular sentiments that you may hear on the street in Bahrain is there is a government-sponsored genocide. I want to be clear, no one here on this panel is claiming that there is such thing, horrible things in Bahrain. However, when you have a good number of population use such words in social media and their discussion, sometimes even in different panels, that is an indication that there is some kind of belief within that population that they are being uh, 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 discriminated. Yet the argument is still wrong. In no way there is, there is anything approaching a genocide in Bahrain against the Shia or otherwise. However, the situation in Bahrain does bear a close relation to another crime against humanity, that of apartheid. It's clear that it's very clear too that the government of Bahrain is waging a campaign of of severe and restrictive discrimination among a large swath of its population. The government include, the government discludes Shia from high government position, it commit acts of violence against Shia youth, and it discludes Shia from service in the military, police, and security forces. And at time even limit their movement by placing barbed wire and security checkpoints around their villages. The criminal justice box Shia defendants with prosecutors stating that such defendants are devils in their submission to court. The government attacks Shia religious figures and sites and went so far as to demolish Shia mosque in the crackdown following 2011 <coughs> uprising. In every sector of, of, his, of his or her life, a Shia person feels that the effect of government interference, while there is there, these are not symptoms of genocide, they do uh, a border or re re remblance to an apartheid state. ADHRP most recent report, apart in their own land, government discrimination against Shia and Bahrain, investigate the issue of discrimination against Shia further, it document that the government systematically commits human rights abuses against Shia of its uh, country, treating them like enemies in their own land, while it conducts that the situation falls short of international apartheid on technical ground. The fact that so much of the apartheid convention is implicated 
uh, in the situation of Sea and Bahrain is a significant cause of, alarm, of, of serious alarm. <coughs> I'm not going to go into <coughs> the bios of our uh, uh, respected guest or panelist here shortly. <coughs> On my extreme right, uh, the lawyer Mohammed Taja, who is a well known human rights lawyer in the country. He has defended many uh, uh, political prisoners and human rights defenders. Beside me, our own Saman Nakfi, she's the uh, advocacy, uh, uh, grassroots uh, uh, advocacy associate with ADHRB. On my left is my uh, dear friend, uh, uh, Joshua. So Joshua, uh, right there. Uh, uh, he's a lawyer with, uh, 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 he's a lawyer who practice law in New York and he does pro bono work for uh, Human Rights Watch. Fatma Mutawwa on his uh, left, she's a human rights lawyer in Bahrain, uh, we, which we appreciate uh, for her. I mean, I appreciate her and Muhammad Tajir taking the effort and coming to the council and facing the unfortunate thing that we just seen outside this place. Uh, yeah, and uh, the other guy is not going to speak, but he's going to help Muhammad Ali from our uh, uh, London office. Finally, before I tell this to uh, someone, to, to her presentation. I just want to show you one thing. This is a, publica a publication by the Department of Defense in Bahrain. It says Nur Sunnah, the light of the Sunnah. It is basically, if you read this, clearly states Shia are kafir, mean they're non-Muslim, their blood is halal. Now, this is not from some lunatic publication. This is from the Department of Defense in Bahrain, Quwad Difa al Bahrain. This shows you when we come up with a report like this, there is a reason for it. This is the reason for it. Where government funds are used to basically attack, if you, if you don't want to call it a majority, a sizable portion of the population. With that, I would like to turn the podium to some peace. We have 10 minutes. Thank you, Saint. And thank you, um, everyone, for attending. Um, I am here to present our report, as Hussein mentioned, a part in their own land. This is a report on Shia discrimination uh, in Bahrain, uh, systemic discrimination and persecution that occurs um, consistently against the population, the majority population of Bahrain. Um, the, while the government likes to characterize the 2011 pro-democracy protests as Shia-led, Independent observers have documented a substantial Sunni presence within that uprising, and most populations within that uprising were represented. So, I just want to clarify that this report is not saying that sectarianism has taken over the population of Bahrain. This report is pointing out the fact that the, the government of Bahrain has instituted policies which discriminate against a specific population within the country. Uh, this systemic policy of, of discrimination um, has succeeded in not only subjugating over half of the population, but also um, a government discriminatory attacks against the Shia religious establishment itself. Uh, ADHRB has published this report in its first volume only uh, so far, so this one will cover the state violence against Shia actors, the disclusion of Shia from the process and the government discriminatory acts against the Shia religious establishment. The net effect of the government's discriminatory policy on the Shia population <coughs> has literally set the Shia apart in their own land, which is why we have titled it. <coughs> While Bahrain's Shia and Sunni populations are ready to coexist and have coexisted, the government itself fans the flames of sectarianism to justify its oppression of the Shia majority. Were the Shia considered a race instead of a religious sect, their situation would almost exactly fit the definition of apartheid set by the 1976 Convention on the Subject. Shia apartheid is closer to the truth than the government would want to admit. Uh, I'd first like to talk about the violence against the Shia. Shia experience violence in the form of police action against protests, arbitrary detention in government holding centers and prisons, government torture largely extracted largely to extract false confessions, tear gas employed against Shia villages, interference with the freedom of movement, and the denial of medical care. 
The excessive force against peaceful protests includes uh, tear gas, includes uh, assault during arrest, as well as the physical barriers that divide the Shia villages from the rest of the country. The way that they promote this sectarian idea of that these protests are Shia-led is by preventing Sunnis and Shias from coming together geographically, <coughs> by putting the security checkpoints and the hard wires around the villages. In the beginning of the protest, everybody was united, and the government was scared. So in order to uh, prevent that from happening again, they had to make sure that they kept the country divided and then could continue their propaganda, um, that the Shia were trying to lead a, a sectarian effort. Uh, the other excessive force used against Shias are in the, in the Bahraini prisons. The Shia prisoners are more likely to be tortured, more likely to be uh, held in solitary confinement. There's a video of a Shia prisoner who is arrested for a criminal act being beaten by a prison official. That's all over the media. It's not even a hidden fact. They, have, they do this with impunity. Um, the ombudsman that is that has been instituted to accept complaints from these prisoners or from the Shia citizens of Bahrain has been pretty much ineffectual. We have another report called Subservient and Unaccountable, which is also available on the table over there, which details this, um, the ineffectual results of the ombudsman, despite the <coughs> complaints that have been submitted from Shia prisoners in the prisons. Uh, also in the prisons is the denial of medical care. Uh, the Shia prisoners are prevented from receiving basic uh, medical care for chronic conditions, pre-existing conditions, as well as treatment for, for the injuries and illnesses that occurred as a result of the torture they suffered. Um, there are also medical workers in prison for, that are in prison for helping protesters, whether they be Shia or Sunni. Um, of the 48 medical workers that were arrested after the 2011 protest, 47 of them were Shia. Uh, there are three medical workers still in prison to this day in Bahrain, um, all Shia, again, and they, again, are charged with political crimes as opposed to some sort of criminal act just for helping protesters who have to be Shia. Uh, I'd like to move on to the political discrimination and marginalization that uh, exists in Bahrain um, as a result of Bahrain's policies. There is no formal separation of powers. Uh, so the royal family and loyalist branches of the government have veto power over the elected officials in Bahrain. Uh, there is an upper house and a lower house. The lower house is the elected house. However, the upper house, which is appointed by the royal family and the ruling government, has veto power over whatever legislation is passed by the lower house. The lower house has never had a majority of Shia representation, despite the fact that Shias are a majority of the population in Bahrain. There is no one man, one vote in Bahrain. Uh, prior to 2011, the districts were set up so that the Shia districts had up 16,000 constituents in one district represented by one member of parliament, while some of the Sunni districts had 750 people under one parliamentarian. So the, the Shia politicians must actually work harder than their Sunni counterparts, because, and the system ensures that they will still yield less as a result of their uh, political <coughs> participation in the Bahraini government. Um, also, demographic manipulation has occurred in order to reduce the majority Shia population. Uh, there is legalistic coercion, there is state violence. Uh, as, a as a matter of policy, Bahrain recruits Sunni foreigners to serve in their military and police forces. These foreign nationals are then offered fast track to citizenship, and these Sunnis often come from cultures seen as amenable to the ruling family, uh, primarily sediment, Sunni Bedouin tribes in Saudi Arabia, Syria, Yemen, Jordan, although many also originate in Pakistan. While Bahrain does not publish the official numbers, their estimates of these naturalized Sunni citizens meet or exceed 50,000, uh, amounting to around 8% of a portion of an island whose citizenry hovers around 600,000 people. Pakistani expats alone account for between 25 to 30,000 naturalized Pakistanis. <coughs> this is especially interesting because Pakistan is a country that has uh, been experiencing an epidemic of targeted Shia killings in their country. 
it happens on a weekly basis. And it would be very, it's just a very interesting note <coughs> that that is where a majority of the security forces and government employees come from to um, rule or to help rule over the Shia majority country. At the same time, while the government is giving these citizenships to these government employees that are brought in from foreign countries, the government has continued to deny citizenship to hundreds of eligible persons within the Bahrain merely on account of their membership to the Shia sect. Uh, a 2008 study estimated that 2,000 stateless families reside in Bahrain, many of whom were Shia families that qualified for citizenship under the Bahraini law. While an updated figure is not available, new stories regarding such families continue to emerge in the local media. Uh, citizenships are, are often revoked um, from Shia people who do express their dissent against the government, and even when they don't. Uh, in certain cases, they have uh, deported people or uh, revoked the citizenship of people who are living outside the country at the time, preventing them from returning. Um, our own executive director is one of those. Um, also, as far as political participation, the Bahraini government last year, 2014, at the end of the year in December, arrested the al Waqaf Secretary General, Sheikh Ali Salman, um, and his trial is the 25th of this month. He's still awaiting trial. He's still in prison. Uh, he is the Secretary General of the largest Shia opposition party in Bahrain, and the fact that he is in prison goes to show exactly what the situation is for the Shia people of Bahrain. Uh, there's also, uh, moving on really quickly, to the, uh, to the discrimination against the establishment of the Shia religion. So 38 mosques were bulldozed, destroyed by the Bahrain government during the 2009 uprising. Since then, international pressure uh, made the government promise to rebuild these mosques, but three, four years, five years later, four years later, um, Six have been rebuilt, and those were rebuilt by the community's money, not by the government's money. Um, the main big uh, mosques where most people congregate have not been rebuilt. Uh, the Barbali Mosque, which was built in 1992, which is a Shia mosque that shows the Shia heritage of Bahrain, had, was bulldozed. It happened to be on the causeway to Saudi Arabia, so it may be a sore site, a sore site for those people traveling to and from Saudi Arabia. But that has not been. A lot of permits have also been denied to people who are wish to rebuild those mosques, and that has not been done either. <coughs> um, I just want to conclude that the sectarianism that exists is not within the population of Bahrain. It is within the government of Bahrain. It is something that is promoted by the government of Bahrain. The Shia and Sunni have lived side by side in Bahrain without any problems. Um, they, the Sunnis did join the protest because of democratic reforms that were requested by all of the population and not necessarily just the Shia population. The fact that the majority of the population happens to be Shia is the reason why the government is targeting those people specifically. Again, um, this is has become an apartheid-like situation. Um, if apartheid could include religion as well, um, and this is something that the international community needs to take note. So. Thank you. Uh, one of our panelists cannot join us today because uh, of a clear case of uh, prizer against him. Nabi Rajab is going to uh, say a few words uh, uh, via Skype. So, uh, Nabi, uh, please go ahead. Yes, uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. And uh, I'm happy that, that I could be with you at least. Uh, and uh, I was supposed to be with you there in the family, but because of the uh, cases that have been seen going on, that I'm banned from traveling for the past uh, five, six months. And as you know, uh, I just was released uh, after spending two years in jail. And I was again sentenced for six months, for a week, uh, where I'm waiting for the appeal verdict in three days' time. So in three days' time, I could start spending my six months in jail, beside new cases which has been made uh, against me. And one of these cases is that uh, accusing the government of uh, discrimination, discriminating against Shia. So that gives you a picture on what is going on. The crime itself, 
it is not considered to be a crime here. We have not seen in our court any of those people practicing discrimination against Shia are brought to justice, but people like me who have been raising the issue of discrimination against Shia will be brought before justice and will be sentenced, I don't know for how long. I just remember in 2004, we did uh, represent, present our first report in Shia and discrimination against Shia to the Committee on uh, Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And the uh, UN uh, committee have asked Bahrain to come out with details of the number and percentage of Shia working in many institutions. And now it's more than 10 years. Uh, uh, those uh, information were not submitted. I'm going to talk to you as a Shia and not, and not as an activist right now. I am staying in a village called Beni Jamra. Beni Jamra is a Shia village, which is surrounded by the troops, by special forces who were brought from Pakistan, Jordan, and Syria, and who were tear gassing the whole uh, village in a daily basis, a nightly basis. And whenever I go out and in, I'm being checked by those troops who come out from a Sunni background and surrounding a Shia village. And as you all know, I'm not allowed to move to another area, to Sunni area, because since uh, 1996, uh, a decree was released by the late Amir saying that to stay in at least 40 to 55 percent of the land, you have to be granted permission from the royal, royal court. So in that regard, they have empty almost 50 percent of the country from a Shia. So I am not allowed to go and stay in a safer area. I am going to be. Uh, brought before uh, court in three days time. I was first interrogated by a police, which is made by Sunni, and people who be brought for interrogation, majority of them, if it is not all, are Shia. Then my case was transferred to the public prosecutor, whom all the members that interrogated me and investigated in all the cases that I was accused are Sunnis, and we all, people who were brought before those public Prosecutor are Shia. And now we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be in three days' time before court. And the court and judges, all of them are Sunni. And those people who were brought before those judicial institutions all are Shia. I mean, by saying Shia as a Sunni, I'm not trying in any way accusing or the Sunnis. Our problem of the problem with the system, we build up the system, and not those people. Sunnis or Shia who are victims of this system because the system has a problem and not the people. And again, I'm going to be in jail in three days' time, and the jail with thousands of people in it, at least 3,500 3, political prisoners or prisoners related to political situation are Shia. And uh, people who are working there, 400 people, are from Jordanian police who come from the Sunni background. And this is how they divided the country. And the problem is that this, what I am saying right now to you, considered to be a crime. It is a taboo that we cannot talk about. Not even we can take a case or issue or raise a case. It's going to be a crime. And this is what, ha what has happened to me when I have been raising this issue for the past many years. And also, my son has to go to a school and study compulsory, he has to study religion. But he has to study religion based on a Sunni sect, not a Shia sect. A Shia sect of a majority of the population. He is forced and to see the army and the police who are all made by Sunni uh, sect. And unfortunately, the only time I have seen the army coming to my town and to my area, and to my village, is only to demolish the Shia mosque. The only time this army was deployed was just Shia Mosque in Bahrain. So this is a, a, a little picture with the time frame I have been given to show how much uh, discrimination has made a majority marginalized uh, group and uh, minority uh, empowered group which is uh, close to the government. If we keep quiet, and if we've been keeping quiet in a lot of countries, institution were keeping quiet in what's happening. 
this is going to create a foundation of a, a future uh, clash or conflict between Shia and Sunni. We have to work and take this matter very seriously. Seeing all the civil wars going on around us, it is all about empowering a group and marginalizing another group. And this is what is going on in Bahrain. Bahrain, unfortunately, Bahrain government thinks the stability, they think the stability of the regime lies on making the majority population uh, poor, uneducated, uh, people uh, who don't have work, uh, unemployed, uh, homeless population. And that's why you see the majority of homeless people are Shia. The majority of, of people who don't get uh, uh, citizenship, Bahraini citizenship, are Shia. At the same time, when Bahraini government brought 10,000 of people from a neighboring country and naturalizing them and giving them nationality to make sure to change the demography of the state and to make the majority to a minority and minority to a majority. This is a problem. This is a problem going in this time where the whole world stood against this kind of a problem in South Africa. Without the support, the South African God, that apartheid system wouldn't have an end. And we have exactly the same apartheid system. It's not written. Unfortunately, you can't see it. it's not written. But in practice, it's been practiced everywhere. The institution made, made divided Shias and Sunni areas. I have brought up and born in a mixed area, Shias and Sunni. That's why my family is mixed between Shias and Sunni. All my sister and my nephews and nieces are Sunnis because we brought up and born in a mixed area. But that mixed area does not exist anymore. The government has separated even the housing plan, even the hospital, even the institution. She has the Sunni. If that continues, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for the stability of the country and stability of the region. A lot of countries, unfortunately, who are having good relations good military relation with the Bahraini government could play a role to influence that situation, to make it better. Taking that into consideration, I would welcome the Swedish government who, who spoke yesterday about stopping their military ties with Saudi Arabia because of the human rights report. We think all the European countries have to keep human rights beside them when they talk about business. You should not ignore the violation, they should not ignore the same crime was committed in South Africa many years ago. If this keep to go, then we are waiting to see a civil war in this part of the world, which we don't want to see as a human rights activist of organization. Anyway, thanks, thanks for inviting me to speak, and please help me, so next time I can come with you and sit in the panel, because most of the Seminar I've been speaking in the side event in the past uh, month. I've been doing it from here because my country don't allow me to speak out. They don't allow me to go either because of a tweet or because of a statement I made here and there. World is a crime here. By the way, Hussein was saying, showing you a book earlier, and at the same time, when I have many books, all of them uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's advocating for religious extremism. I brought a made, made the, it is made by the military here, by the Bahraini military. And this is specifically, I will show you a book, and you guys have to ask for uh, a copy of it. This book is very anti Shia book. This is, uh, my wife brought it a few days ago from the military hospital. This, if you read this book, and you will believe in this, what is written in this book, you have to kill your next Shia friend. That is what is being advocating our government, unfortunately, on the state of advocating for tolerance, a society which has been made from a Shia and Sunni, government has to play a positive role in advocating for tolerance between all the ideologies, and instead, we have seen strengthening all the extremist Islamist extremists who are being against Shia, be inviting all those extremists from outside to come and speak in Bahrain. Uh, who are known to be anti-Shia. Website of extremism uh, being blocked, in, I mean, being allowed. A human rights group like ours, website is blocked. But you can go and see ISIS group from inside Bahrain. You can open 
uh, website of a group associated with ISIS in Bahrain, but you go to a human rights group, like our group is being done. So this is the situation, the dangerous situation in Bahrain. It's been ignored by the international community for a long time, and it is a threatening now. If we have come on stage, it's a threatening. It has to be highlighted, you have to speak about it, you have to help the people of Bahrain from what is going on. Thank you, and I will be there with you if you guys have any questions. Uh, thank you, Nabil. I just want to uh, uh, bring <coughs> an inter interesting point Nabil made, how the ideology, the unfortunate ideology that supports ISIS uh, somehow being published on government dime uh, in Bahrain, but at the same time Bahrain is a coalition, uh, or in the coalition that that fight ISIS. So that's that's uh, something I, I think seriously we need to think about. <coughs> Before I, I turn the mic to Fatma, I just want to say this is, I know, uh, a very uh, interesting topic. Everyone want to discuss it. Let's <coughs> take the side conversation we're having outside. I don't want to call on people who probably, you know, it's, it's, it's bothering the, the uh, 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 us and the people who want to listen here. So uh, uh, please keep it as quiet as possible. Thank you. Fatma. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Fatma al Mutawa. I'm a lawyer working with too, much, too many political detainees. I'm here to talk about the procedures, uh, the wrong, wrongful procedures done in their arrest until their final verdicts. So, since 2011, we have been experiencing lots of uh, violations to the rights of our clients. I will summarize them uh, in some points. First of all, the first 40 hours, 48 hours of their arrest is usually mysterious. You can't get reminders, the detainees, where, we, where can we find them, or the kinds of charges that are going to be brought against them. Uh, and regardless of the time we provide to the public prosecution or submit uh, official pleas of representation, we still can't find uh, these detainees. They are brought to the public prosecution after official hours sometimes, and sometimes interrogated without the presentation of a magical lawyer uh, who might be standing outside the interrogation room. Uh, this 48 hours can be extended to six months to those arrested under terrorism law without seeing an actual judge or public prosecutor. Uh, second of all, um, extending uh, the detention period should not exceed 150 days according to the panel code. Of course, uh, in the political cases, we see this period going uh, for indefinite time, regardless of the medical, social, or, um, or uh, even um, um, educational circumstances of the detainee. The renewal of detention usually takes place at courts where detainees are brought from secret uh, corridors or uh, secret ways in a way of intention to isolate these um, detainees from their families and their lawyers who are prevented to talk to them or even verbally salute them in the courts of law. Um, in the trials, and when they are brought to trial, we can see the prejudice against the political detainees. Um, the way that the judge speaks to the detainees, the way they are treated by the policemen, it all shows, you know, the way of violation of violating the basic uh, rights of a fair trial. Um, these trials usually depend on two kinds of evidence. It's either secret informers um, that are not under identified and we can't cross examine, or either um, um, witnesses who are actual policemen um, protected by the judge. You can't ask any questions. Um, their their answers are already filtered or directed to court in the conviction box. Um, the thing I want to say is, regardless of the times we submit uh, innocence evidence, uh, this evidence is usually just ignored. I would just recall uh, one of the cases of a uh, young man, Adnan Amiri. We submitted a CD showing that he was playing a basketball match at the time of the incident. He was sentenced for three years, assuming he was in two places at the time. So, um, uh, public prosecution usually mobilizes uh, um, opinion of, of the public opinion against these people, against these people by publishing their photos and, and confessions in, in, in the newspapers about trials uh, with a way uh, to say that they will have the judgment in one way or another. Most of these political trials usually end up with hard judgments that can reach to panel, uh, death penalty or sometimes, you know, stripping of nationalities who actually, which actually, you know, leads to different kinds of uh, problems with these people because their families and themselves would be in exile from, you know, going into the society again. We have too many kids with no nationalities, no IDs, no official papers. Um, and it should, you 
know, it just will raise a lot of problems after they finish their judgments. Um, I just want to say, and I just want to, you know, um, end up with one thing. Language, today in the presence of Bahrain, language is part of lives of young men and young women and young children um, with too much violations on their rights. Their um, circumstances and their cases should be held and researched and revised once and twice and twice so we can help them on the humanitarian level. I am a lawyer and I understand the superiority of law, but I understand also that, that human rights should not be violated. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma. You're a dream for every moderator. I did not have to remind you of when we uh, start. Before I let my friend Josh here uh, uh, give his presentation, I have a reminder here. Uh, there's an event today from 3 to 4.30 organized by the Bahrain uh, Human Rights Obs Observatory, BHRO, uh, room 21, from 3 to 4.30. They have a very interesting and strong uh, 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 set of uh, panelists, uh, Abdel -Nabi, Mr. Abdel Nabi al -Hikri, uh, uh, a veteran of uh, human rights uh, defenders in Bahrain, Mr. Ali Aswad, uh, a former MP from al uh, uh Society, uh, then uh, uh, Brian Julie from Human Rights First, Anthony Madeline from FIDH, and I think, uh, uh, again, I think Fatma will be presenting there something completely different than here, so you have to attend that event from 3 to 4.30, 21, and I think Abdel Nabi have some sweet from Bahrain. He always brings sweet from Bahrain, so it's much better than the sandwiches we had. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Josh, please. Unless the government just took the sweets during the argument outside. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it didn't happen. It is a promotion for Bahraini sweets. <laughs> uh, I asked Hussein if I could get a little extra time since he can't pronounce Italian last names, but uh, I'm not sure he's agreed to that. Uh, I, I think we all would say that a functioning justice system is an essential part of civil society. <clears throat> to look at the justice system in Bahrain and assess it, we should examine two types of cases. First political prosecutions, cases where people are being sent to jail for expressing political opinions or engaging in nonviolent protest. Second, cases where security officials are charged in connection with abuses against members of the public. In terms of the first category of cases, political cases, uh, we know that in 2011, Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, which was appointed by the King of Bahrain, found that military courts set up during that year had convicted about 300 people for political crimes. The King accepted those findings uh, and promised that those sorts of prosecutions would stop. Unfortunately, there is no legitimate dispute that prosecutions based on political expression uh, nonviolent advocacy have continued since then. When I say undisputed, I'm not asking you to trust me. You don't have to take my word for that. You don't have to take the word of human rights activists or defense lawyers. All you have to do is read the words of Bahraini judges as they write them in their own words. And based on those words, it is simply indisputable that people continue to be prosecuted essentially for expressing <coughs> opposition uh, By way of example, there was a very well-known case involving originally 21 prominent opposition activists, uh, 14 of whom uh, were tried in custody, 7 of whom were tried in absentia. Uh, the military court pronounced convictions <coughs> and very heavy jail terms uh, for all of those people, essentially because they were members of a group called the Coalition for a Republic. As I'm sure you can uh, infer, the Coalition for a Republic called for the establishment of a republic in Bahrain. A civilian appeals court heard that case and affirmed, in essence, all of the convictions, including a number of convictions for terrorism. What was interesting were the, the was the reasoning of the court in affirming those convictions. Again, I don't want you to take my word for it, so let me quote from the judges themselves. Uh, the court said that an organization with, quote, the goal of removing the monarchical system, close quote, 
was in and of itself illegal. If you're part of a group that wants to have a republic in Bahrain, you are part of an illegal group, and engaging in that kind of advocacy <coughs> is a crime, no questions asked. The court said, under our law, we do have to find that the defendants used force to uh, conclude that they engaged in terrorism, and here they did. The interesting thing in this regard is what the court said about the definition of force. And again, let me, let me quote. Uh, the court said, force doesn't have to involve, quote, the use of weapons. Rather, force may be exercised in other actions, such as organizing and leading popular demonstrations as a tool to pressure the government, close quote. Later, the court said, and I apologize for my serial quotations, quote, terrorism is realized in all means of moral pressure, close quote. If you cannot engage in moral pressure against the government, how can you engage in any manner of protest? If calling for democracy is illegal, how can there be any freedom of speech? But these were the very principles that the court relied on, and that, in fact, it had to rely on, because it did not find that a single defendant had engaged in a single act of specific violence. Another case that began in military courts involved medical personnel, 20 of whom were convicted uh, by the military courts in connection with protests that took place in the spring of 2011 at Bahrain's largest medical facility. Bahrain's highest court, the Court of Cassation, reviewed those convictions. It affirmed a number of convictions for the crime of promoting the overthrow of the regime. Specifically, and let me quote again, the court said that, quote, calling for the transformation of the state's political system into a republic or constitutional monarchy constitutes the commission of a crime, close quote. That is Bahrain's highest court saying definitively, beyond dispute, that if you ask for democracy in Bahrain, you are a criminal. I will note, and I don't mean to suggest that this is actually humorous, but by comparison, sometimes it strikes me that way. Uh, the court also affirmed the conviction of a nurse for stepping on a photograph of the prime minister, uh, which is a, a, a separate issue entirely, uh, but one for which the court found a criminal conviction was, was proper. It's not only <clears throat> cases that began in military courts where we've seen this dynamic. There was a, a prosecution that began in civilian courts by which 50 people, mass trial, 50 people, were convicted for being involved with a group called the February 14th Coalition. Now, a lot has been said about that group uh, and its involvement in violence. The court itself said in vague terms that the coalition was designed to foster chaos through violence. But what's critical to note here is the specific basis for the court's convictions of these defendants. What the court found was that the defendants had organized protests. They had promoted these protests on Skype and Twitter uh, and something that's called WhatsApp, which maybe all of you know, but I only found out about when I read that verb. Apparently, it's another, uh, another piece of social media. Uh, the court found that the defendants had given interviews to members of the media about the protests and that they had pictures of the protests. Those were the actions upon which the court said these defendants were guilty. To be perfectly fair, uh, and uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I will say the court found that one defendant had committed an act of violence. Specifically, that defendant was found to have scratched a policeman at the time of his arrest. Putting that aside, there was no finding that any of the defendants had done anything violent at all. Uh, to look at another category of cases, we've seen multiple prosecutions for insulting the king. Uh, these tend to be the insult by Twitter cases, where somebody, maybe a Rajab or others who are, are less well known, will in a tweet suggest something to the effect that the king should step down. Uh, a year ago, the penalty for expressing those sorts of ideas was increased so that now there is a maximum jail term of seven years. Uh, when we asked the Attorney General about what it took for someone 
to truly insult the king uh, and therefore be, be criminally liable. The Attorney General said it's really only about a tax on the king's private life, not official matters. As far as we can tell, nobody has taken issue with the king in a personal way, uh, and instead, as I said, most of these tweets uh, are asking the king to advocate his position. Now, I understand if you're the king and people are asking you to ab abdicate your position, that may feel offensive, but uh, whether it's a criminal violation is a, an entirely different issue. Just by way of one more example, uh, which was mentioned earlier, the leader of Al-Wufa, the largest opposition group in Bahrain, Sheikh Ali Salman, has been uh, brought up on so many charges that frankly it's a little hard to keep track. Uh, originally, I think this was in 2000 and, uh, 2013, he spoke at an exhibition about human rights abuses, um, and he referred to the violations of human rights that the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry had found, been, uh, found to have been committed in Bahrain. Um, and he said, let me, let me quote, because again, that's, uh, that's the way I like to do things, that he hoped Bahrain would, quote, embrace all Bahrainis without exception, without segmentation, without distinction, close quote. According to the charges against him in connection with that event, those remarks were disparaging of the interior ministry. Last year, during the summer, he was charged with meeting uh, with a high-level U.S. diplomat. Um, I certainly know the U.S. is not universally popular, but I think it is still extreme to, uh, to say that it's criminal to meet with, uh, with, with diplomats of, of the U.S. And most recently, he was uh, charged with promoting regime change. So it's an ongoing series of prosecutions, uh, and without a flowchart, it, it's frankly difficult to, to keep track of them. If we look at the second category of cases I mentioned, there are a number of interesting examples. Uh, one of these cases was one that the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry recommended be investigated. Because it involved a man who was a, uh, a detainee the security services, who the independent commission found had been beaten to death. And so naturally, the recommendation was that that incident should be investigated. Well, uh, the police took that charge quite seriously, uh, and they brought two police officers uh, before the court. For whatever reason, the charges lodged against them were assault, not murder, uh, but these gentlemen were before the court. What did the court find? Well, the court found, just like the Commission of Inquiry had, that this man, his name was Ali Sakar, had died through a <coughs> brutal and comprehensive beating. Uh, the court found that he had blunt force contusions essentially everywhere on his body. One of the police officers testified that he and his colleague had beaten the victim until they simply had no strength left to beat him anymore. On the basis of those facts, the court concluded that the defendants had no intent to kill the victim. Didn't explain why, it just said they had no intent to kill the victim, um, but they are guilty of assault. And in connection with that conviction, they imposed a 10-year sentence. Quite notably, an appeals court hearing an appeal from the defendants, took the 10-year sentence and reduced it to a two-year term. And I think you know what I'm about to say next, but let me say it anyway. I'm going to quote from the opinion of the appeals court. The court said it was uh, best to reduce the term to two years because the defendants had been, quote, preserving the life of detainees, among them the victim, close quote. <laughs> So when you beat someone so severely that they have blunt force contusions over their whole body, and you only stop because you simply have no more strength to continue, you deserve clemency on an assault conviction because you have been preserving the life of the man you killed. Again, don't take my word for it. Don't take the word of the defense lawyers or the human rights advocates. Just read the verdict because those are the words on the page. Uh, I'll mention one, one other case. 
Uh, this, in this case, the victim was a man named uh, Hani Juma. <clears throat> the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry found that he was the victim of an unjustified shooting. He was shot while running away from a protest. <clears throat> Prosecutors brought a policeman uh, <coughs> to, to court in connection with that incident. Again, they charged him with assault, uh, which is uh, questionable as a, as a threshold matter, but that was the charge in front of the, the court. The court found that without justification and from one meter away, the police officer fired two shots uh, that killed Ani Juma. On the basis of those facts, and with no explanation at all, the court said, this defendant had no intent to, con to kill the victim it's really only an assault, and sentenced him to a seven-year term. You can probably guess what happened next, which was that an appeals court heard the case and took that seven-year term and reduced it to six months. Six months for shooting a defendant from one meter away multiple times without justification. So perhaps it's a comparison that really underscores the true nature of the, the justice system in if you call for the establishment of a republic, that's an offense that gets you a life sentence in prison. If you shoot a protester who is running away twice from one meter without any justification, that gets you six months in jail. I don't know if there is a, another way to illustrate the realities of the system better than that. I will note that we, we haven't found evidence of judges explicitly saying, let's see what we can do to discriminate against Shia. But if we know that, probably fair to say, a majority of those expressing ideas that are part of the political opposition are Shia, and those who are being targeted by security forces are Shia, and these are the results of the justice system, it's simply inevitable that there is going to be a massively disproportionate <coughs> impact on people who happen to be Shia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Josh. I think uh, your quote opened an eye or clearly makes the case that there is something systematic, certainly there is a systematic injustice in Bahrain toward the majority of the population. Our last uh, but not least panel is uh, uh, my dear friend Mohammed Tajer who has been advocating uh, or pushing for human rights in Bahrain for years. And he is uh, going to conclude you know, our, our panels. Muhammad, please. Thank you, Hussein. Um, <clears throat> the morning I was asked by Fatima, what's wrong with you? You are an American Christian. <clears throat> I told her I haven't made up my mind what I'm going to say, and uh, I've asked Hussein, just leave me to the end. And it seems that each topic, whether it is about the crisis, a human rights violation, or a subject, we have something always to say. I remember maybe 14 years back when the king Bahrain, Hamad bin Isa, has implemented his reform project. As a Shia, I always look to our presentation, representation in the cabinet. And I remember in the 90s that I used to work as a journalist, and we used to see, to, to, to see the kind of, of uh, share of both, and that is the main idea why still people in Bahrain are raising their voices for a democracy in Bahrain. In the 90s and when the king started his rule, they were there and said for Shia. In 2003, they have a report 
which is stated that the Shia consists only 18% of the top jobs in the government, not only in the ministries, even to the companies owned and controlled by the government. <coughs> that is a year or a few years later after King Hamad took over from his late father. Within five years, that percentage has been lowered from 18 to 13. I'm wondering now, there are more ministers in, in Bahrain than China, around 90 cabinet, and maybe 60 of them are without a minister or a consultant. But only four of these 90 are Shia. We were in the 90s looking to some sectors which are named as a Shia sectors, like power and water, transportation, education, health care. These are the, the, the where the specialty is needed, where technician is needed, and mainly where people <coughs> should be qualified to work in this sector, or there is no qualification needed for a technician or an operator or whatever. What at present, if we look at these sectors, we are going far away from more than five authorities where Shia event consists of even a 0.5 percentage. Well, I'm not talking about the Supreme Court of Security uh, Supreme uh, Court. I'm not talking about the jury system. I'm not talking <coughs> about the Ministry of Defense. I'm not talking about uh, the, 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 uh, if we go and look, even the jury system, out of 117 judges, there are seven sheets. In the past four years, since 2011, I haven't seen more than one or two Shia becoming a public prosecution deputy. By the way, the public prosecution prosecutor is a Sunni. The military public prosecutor is a Sunni. The head of the Cassation Court is a Sunni. The head of the military Cassation Court is a Sunni. <coughs> the the, the minister, justice minister is a Sunni. The head of legislation uh, the directorate is a Sunni. Even the head of Bahrain Commercial Center is a Sunni. So, from that, and Nabil already said that not only judges, investigators, policemen, guards in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the prisons, and I remember one of the OCHR representative in Bahrain a year back, he said it is astonishing. <coughs> All these are Sunni where the prisoners are Shia. That's why if we ask about justice, before law, we should ask how people who share the same thinking were in this book, which was shown by Nabil or Hussein, can bring justice to all Bahrainis. Now, I know Hussein would not like me to speak about genocide or crime against humanity, but what we will say, exclusion. Apartheid. It is only discrimination. That's all. Systematic. He wants me to say just systematic discrimination. Not more than that. Okay. Remember that convention said crime against humanity should never demolish places where it form a kind of symbol for, for, for any sack. And the Barbary Mosque is a symbol for us. 38 mosques, most of them a symbol for us. Moreover, Bahrain government is not taking a decision like in 2011 to kill all protesters. But still they are killing people inside prison by torture. As Ali Zabtar lost his life and Fakhawi and the others. Still, the shotguns taking a lot of life in the streets. Still, we won't be being tortured in the, in the prisons. 
But the government had decided something else, again, with the King Reform Project. Bahrainis and major and mainly Shia, their sentence had been delivered even inside Bahrain. If we come to know that around 90,000 of newly naturalized Sunni from Pakistan, India, Jordan, Yemen, Syria, all over the world, where, as Nabil said, the only people who have been revoked from their citizenship mainly are Shia. And the government decided not to call protesters, but keeping more than 3,000 Shia in jail. It means she is protecting Shia from getting married and from get, getting child. It means that double this number is a protected. 3,000 plus 3,000 of women who can't get married from these 3,000. So you, how, how many kids are, are prevented? If we, if we want to talk about it in some different way. <coughs> they are living mainly in, in villages, but they are not being allowed to enlarge or extend outside these places because they are sequestered in an area where these newly naturalized people will control these places. So you have only one idea, either to flee the country or to flee this place or integrate it with the others anywhere else. They are ready to do this. But inciting them everywhere and protecting them from working, it's not only this, denying their right for where, for education. It's as simple as Bahrain <coughs> is protecting Shia, not by keeping them in prison, even protecting them from being educated. Do you know that Bahrain has banned anybody from going studying abroad unless he gets a permission from the Prime Minister of Israel? <coughs> no ministry, no company is allowed to send anybody for a fellowship because the Ministry of Education <laughs> wants to control this 78% of the high scorer in the, in the high school who comes from Shia from going and studying abroad because they don't want doctors anymore, they don't want lawyers, they don't want journalists because they found out that they have no loyalty to the, to the, to the let us say that regime. Now, is it accepted that Bahrain, Bahrainis who are educated, they will go through an interview and out of, hundred, out of the 100 percent, 25 percent, is the marks of, from the interviewer, interviewer. And from the man who will interview them, will give them zero percent if he found out that he come from a family who is known as not mm -hmm. loyal. Moreover, this man, if he decides to go up study to China, to Czech Republic, to Ukraine, to Lebanon, to India, all universities in these countries are not certified and accepted and registered in Bahrain. As simply because the Shia find no fellowship from the government, so it's, they decide by themselves to go and study there. Bahrain government or all universities in Bahrain, Gulf University and Bahrain University, are in the 700 ranking about in the, in the list of the best universities around the world, while China ones are in the 50s. But still, because they found out that there are around 700 students, Bahraini Shia students, studying there. So they said we are not notifying <coughs> the certificate. It means you can't wait. I have to conclude because we are running out. We are running out of time. So, to conclude, now we have a problem of <coughs> where the government would not like to say that there is a division, that there is racism, that there is discrimination, but it should recognize that there is a major problem in Bahrain. And if they are sending around 200 civil societies are registered in Bahrain, unlike Bahrain, 
unlike ADHRB, unlike Bahrain Center for Human Rights or BAIL, who are registered outside because they are not allowing them to work. But they are sending NGOs or Congos or whatever you want to name them, or their representative, to participate in discussion about the transitional justice, about any kind of reconciliation. Bahrain government should recognize that there is a real problem in Bahrain. That is separation the nation between loyalists and non-loyal and traitors. Distributing them between Sunni and Shia. And unless they, they can put their hand in the real problem and start any kind of, of reconciliation process and by, by forming any kind of national authority which control or monitor this, way, this wave of hatred in the media, in the social media, and mainly subjected against majority of Bahrainis, and we are sorry to speak about Shia, but this is the reality which we don't want to repeat, which we don't want to understand. But it is a reality. And unless the top officials in Bahrain believe that it is the right of everybody to have democracy, to have to, have, to live in a human places, place like Bahrain, and they can feel that democracy and the share of power is the right, their right, their right and our right and our next generation right. Until they, they, they recognize this, there will not be peace in Bahrain. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, we have 15 minutes. I'm going to take a, a set of questions and then we'll give it to the panelists. Please try to make your question short, refrain from a uh, uh, statement. I will start with someone. Uh, thank you, the panelists. Uh, uh, my question uh, could be uh, addressed to any of the panelists. The claim by, let's say, democratic states here in the Council and worldwide is that their assessment is that the crisis in Bahrain is manageable. I mean, it's, it could be tolerated as, you know, if, if we take uh, indicators of casualties, those killed, those are, do you think that it is manageable crisis? Do you expect that it will deteriorate more? Or, and do you agree on this assessment or not? Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Amanda Mulani and I'm from Bury. Um, first of all, I, I want to say that I'm very shocked to, to be a witness to the kind of threats that took place um, outside this room in a place that we call the Human Rights Council. And given that we are here in the Human Rights Council, I wanted to ask one of the members of the panel, um, what do you think, uh, what are your recommendations for um, the UN and the Office of the High Commissioner in addressing the problem of sectarian discrimination in Bahrain um, to avoid its escalation? Thank you. Thank you. I want to declare a few statistics uh, that uh, we found it out this is so totally accurate and then I can raise my question. It is really Bahrain is a unique internationally to find out there is a discrimination against the majority and it is not by a minority, it is by a ruling family mainly. And I can hear the less for you the clear indication. Although regarding the, uh, the Constitution, 73, or 2002, or even National Charter, or even economical vision of uh, uh, Crown Prince, they have been written idly, but when you come to the statistics, clearly we can see. Here, I can mention that within the administration branches of the country, the, they occupy only 15%, the Shia are occupying just 15% of the executive branch, 12% of the judiciary, just 10% of the government bodies, and companies are Shia, and just 1% of the security apparatus are Shia, which includes even the army. And see here, the higher defense council in Bahrain is made up 14 members, and out of them, just there is one Sunni, and 13 are from Woody family. So in this case, this is the question comes. What are the mechanisms we, as a people of Bahrain, 
to use to reach our right. We don't want any sectarian solution. We are not looking for any Shia government. Just we want a total national government, democratic government. So what are the process? How do you advise us? Thank you. What are the, the international tools or mechanisms that we can use? Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? The lady at the back. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Dr. Mona Mitres. I'm the chair of Together for Human Rights. Uh, I, I heard most of, um, of the uh, panelists and I received a message uh, that's saying that there is a Shia majority that's oppressed by a Sunni minority, which is a message I totally reject. There is no, no such thing in Bahrain, and there is no Shia majority or Sunni minority. Actually, there is no census that says that. Then, the, uh, the thing is that we are having a social crisis since the beginning of our crisis in 2011, which is the sectarian divide. Shia and Sunnis would never experienced this divide before uh, 2011. And I can't blame only the government. I think that we had a political movement since the beginning of last century, and all, all through that century, Shia and Sunni were united in the, in, the, in the fight for their rights, all through that century. What did really happen? How can we diagnose that? What, whose mistake is this? And if we diagnose it right, we can solve it right. I think that I, I want an answer today for what is the way out? What do you suggest? Is this the message, the negative message that we have in apartheid against uh, the Shia? And there is, uh, I think that because because I come from a human rights uh, association which is called together, and uh, I, I, I believe that the only solution is to bring the Shia and Sunnis together to fight for their rights, not to fight for the Shia's rights only. And this is the main mistake of the opposition, that they are fighting for one sex rights. This is not, not accepted and we cannot take it on. All right, I think po po point will take in. Uh, BIC, BIC, I said Shia majority, just want to let you know. So you can go back and, and read that documentation and then have it with the Sunni and see why did he say she has majority. We could have this discussion also outside, but your question is written and hopefully the panelists will answer it. Any more? Yes, the gentleman over there. If you could come to the mic, please. Yes, yes. Uh, a number of years ago, I was invited by the British Embassy to come and have a look at the situation in Bahrain in 2009. I can tell you with all confidence that everybody in power I met was not a Shia. Every person who is complaining was a Shia. <laughs> all the wicked groups were Shia. I was actually quite shocked to what I have seen. So I would strongly suggest that the onus of human rights advocates and of supporters of the Bahraini government actually do something about the situation, which is, as you rightly said, is akin to apartheid. And unless they do that and they get engaged in PR, in paying lots of PR companies, Lots of money to uh, try to sort of improve their image, putting a Christian woman ambassador in London and a Jewish one in Washington is not going to solve your problem. The Bahraini government needs to release the most moderate opposition leader Bahrain has had. It is wrong, times wrong, times wrong. And they really need to deal with it and take the lead. Bahrain can potentially be a place for coexistence because it has a lot of <coughs> middle class youth. It has a lot of enlightened people. And unfortunately, the government of Bahrain today have resorted to sectarianism in order to secure their place in power. Th thank you. I think we're. I'll let the panel, we have seven minutes left. Uh, I was, uh, please, uh, the panels, minute and a half, I'll be as firm as possible. Nabil, please stop. Uh, 
And those who could not ask the question, the panels are available outside the event. Nabi, please go ahead. Yeah, well, I haven't heard most of the question, but maybe a couple of questions. One gentleman asked how we can, or the UN can do. I mean, we need the recognition. First of all, we can't have a solution before they, we got the, we could recognize the problem that we have. So far, nobody, none of the international human rights or the human bodies talk deeply or tackle deeply the problem of the apartheid in Bahrain or the discrimination against Shia in Bahrain. We need to bring the UN to recognize, and those countries who have a strong uh, military tie, strong uh, commercial tie with Bahrain, European who does respect the human rights, they have to do that and they have to do their business with Bahrain. The same thing Sweden did, have done yesterday with the Saudi. We, we think the, Saudi, the British government should do that rather than building a new base on Bahrain. Second, uh, in regard to the question raised by a woman, it seems, I think, from the government of Bahrain, nobody have said that uh, Nobody have said that Sunnis discriminate against Shia. Nobody is blaming the Sunnis. Nobody at all. And we always said, you can see all our statements. Don't, uh, don't present our story in the way you want. It is the government. It, the system allows that. Tomorrow the system will allow the Shia to discriminate against the Sunni. So we will go against the system, not against the Sunni, not, not against the Shia. We have a problem about justice. We have a problem about equality. We have a problem about freedom, about human rights, about democracy. This is the struggle we're talking about. Those are the standards we are fighting for, and not for Shia, and not for Sunni. Thank you. Thank you, Nabi. Really quick, I just want to answer uh, about the, the UN recommendations in specifics. Uh, just that we can consider passing a resolution that the UN Human Rights Council condemning the human rights situation in Bahrain, specifically the discrimination against uh, the population of, of the Shia that live there. Uh, the other thing that we could do is facilitate the special rapporteurs to visit Bahrain, especially the special rapporteur on torture and the special rapporteur on freedom of religion and belief. And finally, going back to the, uh, the convention on, I guess, apartheid, if we can perhaps amend the definition to include uh, identities based on religion or other identities uh, that have been persecuted against in this extreme fashion, um, and to, to expand the definition of apartheid. Um, for the, the lady in the back who's asking what is the way to move forward for Bahrainis, um, including Shia members in all of these government institutions that we've mentioned, uh, everybody in the panel has mentioned, in the courts, in the security forces, in the cabinet, um, even just representative of the demographics that exist within the country would be a huge step. Um, and that's uh, thank you very much. I uh, just want to mention anything. I cannot blame my own family. My, 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 no, we can discuss outside. My, uh, my half of my family is from the Sunni sect, and no one here is blaming that. Uh, we're blaming. Thank you very much. This meeting is over because we have another one. Thank you. We can have the discussion outside. Of course, I will continue discussing. We just want to clear up what happened you lost an opportunity as a government member. You should let them come in because it's head of the